the Type 45 destroyers of the Royal Navy are meant to be Britain's ultimate surface combatants, with an unwavering focus on air defence capabilities above all else. Together with the Queen Elizabeth-class aircraft carriers providing air support, and the Astute-class attack submarines, and the Type 26 large frigates, they form the backbone of the British Royal Navy's fighting strength. While Britain is no longer the global naval power it was in the past, nevertheless, in Europe, Britain remains one of the leading European naval powers, alongside France and, to an extent, Italy. So, what happens to the UK's most important surface combatants matters for the global naval balance, particularly vis-à-vis -vis emerging naval powers like China and Russia. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the Type 45 destroyers, also known as the Daring class. Until this point, it's fair to say that the Type 45 has underperformed against expectations due to a number of crucial mechanical failures. But the underperformance, it has to be said, should not be generalized. The class has satisfied some of its core mission expectations, even while other areas have fallen short. For example, the air defense capability has very much met expectations, at least based upon the limited operational experience so far. The principal anti-air missile system on the Type 45, also known as the Sea Viper, has proven able to defend against the type of threat it is designed against reasonably effectively. Where the class has fallen short is in terms of availability and the reliability of its propulsion system. In particular, the breakdown of a couple of small but crucial components under hot weather in the Middle Eastern waters has led to the breakdown of the Type 45's propulsion. And because the Type 45 uses an integrated electric propulsion, in some cases it has left the entire ship without power, including its own important combat systems and weapons. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. First, we need to look at the mission profile of the Type 45, and what it has done well, and what's not so well before we can put the high-profile failures of the recent years into context. The Type 45 is the Royal Navy's principal air defense platform, designed to shield carrier strike groups and allied naval formations from airborne threats such as aircraft, cruise missiles, and increasingly ballistic missiles. Equipped with the Sea Viper system, it provides long-range detection and engagement of multiple targets simultaneously. The Sea Viper air defense system consists of four key components. The Samson Active Electronically Scanned Array Radar, the S1850M Air Surveillance Radar, a 48-cell silver vertical launching system, and the combat management system composed of a network of high-end computers. Unlike the fixed panel radars that you will find on American and Chinese destroyers, the main volume search radar on the Type 45, the Samson ASAR radar, is a two-sided rotating array housed in a radium and mounted at the top of an integrated mast. The key difference is that this radar relies on rotation, while the fixed panel arrays, by definition, do not. The Samson makes one full 360-degree rotation every four seconds. The advantage of a rotating array is that it is generally lighter and therefore can be mounted higher than the larger fixed radar panels. The disadvantage, on the other hand, is that a rotating radar can never provide true 360 degree coverage in real time. That's the downside. The S1850M surveillance radar supports the Samson in long range volume search, freeing up the more capable ASAR radar to perform higher priority tasks in a combat situation. In terms of air defense missiles, 
the vertical launching system contains 48 missile cells. They carry a mix of the ASTER-15 and the ASTER-30 surface-to-air missiles to provide a layered defense against the spectrum of aerial threats across a range of altitudes, from low-flying sea-skimming cruise missiles to high-altitude aircraft. The ASTER-15 is optimized for short and medium-range engagements against targets out to roughly 30 kilometers while the ASTER-30 is the longer-range missile that extends the air defense coverage out to around 120 kilometers. The lead ship, the HMS Daring, has been testing defenses against ballistic missiles for a long time. Early tests began in the 2010s, when HMS Daring participated in joint trials with the U.S. Missile Defense Agency to assess integration of the Sea Viper system into wider NATO missile defense frameworks. These experiments confirmed that the ship's Samson radar and combat system could track ballistic targets during live fire trials. These early tests proved the radar's ability to detect and follow high speed, high altitude objects, an essential prerequisite for ballistic missile interception. In 2022, the UK Ministry of Defence formally launched the Sea Viper Evolution Programme, which will equip all six Type 45s with the ASTA-30 Block 1 missiles, capable of intercepting short to medium range ballistic missiles. The ship's Samson radars and command and control systems are being upgraded to process the faster, higher trajectory of ballistic missile threats. The first operational proof came in April 2024, when the HMS Diamond successfully intercepted a ballistic missile fired by the Houthis over the Red Sea. The first such engagement by a Royal Navy warship, and a successful engagement at that. When complete, the Sea Viper Evolution upgrade will integrate the Type 45s into the NATO Ballistic Missile Defense Network. In parallel, over the next 5 to 10 years, a new 24-cell Sea Scepter missile launcher will be installed on each destroyer. This will provide an additional layer of short to medium range air defense against lower end threats, such as drones and subsonic cruise missiles allowing all 48 of the original silver VLS missile cells to be dedicated to the long-range ASTA-30 interceptors and improving overall missile interception and fleet survivability. While the Type 45 excels in air defense, their capabilities in elder warfare domains are very limited. The class has very little in terms of anti-submarine warfare capabilities. It is reportedly noisy, even for a surface warship, making it easy to detect for submarines. The ship relies entirely on embarked helicopters to detect and engage submarines with Stingray torpedoes. The Type 45 actually has no shipboard torpedo tubes, and the destroyer's hull-mounted sonar provides rather limited acoustic detection constraining its ability to prosecute submarines. Consequently, Type 45s must operate alongside frigates or aircraft to maintain a credible anti-submarine posture, reducing their operational autonomy. In terms of anti-surface warfare, the class originally carried Harpoon anti-ship missiles, but these were retired by 2023 leaving the Type 45 temporarily without a credible offensive capability against surface combatants. The planned replacement, the Naval Strike Missile, is not yet widely deployed, meaning that for a period, Type 45s are dependent on their 4.5-inch naval gun for surface engagement. While the gun can provide limited firepower against ships or land targets, it cannot match the firepower or the range of anti-ship missiles. So, the Type 45 are basically designed for one role only, which is air defense, and 
is not really equipped for most other domains of naval warfare. However, naval warfare requires more than just weapons and radars that are functioning well. You also require functional propulsion and power generation for the ships in question. And the performance of the Type 45 in this respect has been disappointing, to say the least. The propulsion failures of the Type 45 is one of the most serious and widely publicized shortcomings in recent Royal Navy procurement. Designed around an advanced, integrated electric propulsion system, the Type 45's two Rolls-Royce WR21 gas turbines were intended to deliver exceptional efficiency and lower maintenance. In practice, however, the entire propulsion system is only as good as its weakest link. While the performance of the two gas turbines by themselves was okay, a crucial component that enables these turbines had a major flaw. This is the intercooler recuperator system designed by Northrop Grumman. This intercooler unit reportedly had a major design flaw that causes the gas turbines to overheat and to shut down under high ambient temperatures. Without the gas turbines to supply parts of the electricity needed for the ship's integrated electric propulsion, or for the hotel load, the remaining diesel generators on the ship are not enough to handle the electrical load on their own. When this happens, the diesel generators shut down as well, presumably due to the triggering of safety thresholds, leaving the ship with no sources of power. As I said, this mechanical breakdown tends to happen under high temperature, this meant the propulsion system proved temperamental in the Middle East and in tropical climates, where air and sea temperatures can exceed the tolerance of the propulsion setup. This led to repeated total electrical failures, leaving ships adrift and without power or propulsion. Even when total electrical failure did not happen, the overall supply of electricity to the ship tends to be vastly reduced, affecting the ship's propulsion and combat effectiveness. Needless to say, this situation would be very dangerous under combat environments or when operating in contested waters. The Royal Navy does not release information on the number and details of the problems experienced by the Type 45 class including propulsion failures. But such incidents have been reported in the media. The first major incident occurred soon after the commissioning of the lead ship. The HMS Daring lost power during her first voyage to the United States in 2009 and suffered more propulsion problems off the coast of Kuwait in 2012. The HMS Dauntless suffered multiple outages during operations off West Africa and had to abandon a training exercise in 2014, when the problem resurfaced at the wrong time. The Royal Navy initially dismissed these propulsion breakdowns as teething problems, but by 2016 admitted that the issue was systemic. The ship's powertrain could not deliver the ship's heavy electrical demand, particularly from its radar, sensors, and propulsion motors. A former naval officer of the Royal Navy, Rear Admiral Chris Perry, used a clever analogy to describe the Type 45 problem. According to him, it's rather like buying a high-priced television to watch your favorite football team. But because you don't have secure power supplies, the power goes off about every 10 minutes. You can't have that in combat. You can't even have that in normal operations. It is not safe. To resolve the issue, the Ministry of Defense launched the Power Improvement Project for the class, requiring each ship to undergo a major refit to address deficiencies in the propulsion system. The term Power Improvement Project was condensed into a fitting acronym, the PIP, or PIP. In corporate jargon, 
This is the performance improvements plan. One of the last steps an organization will go through before they can fire someone for poor performance. In the case of the Type 45 destroyer, you could say it is like a pip for the ship. The program involves cutting open the hull to install new diesel generators and increasing the number of diesel generators from 2 to 3, providing increased power output, redundancy and resilience for the overall electrical grid. The weak link in the propulsion chain, the intercooler unit, was replaced with a more reliable design. The two gas turbines were retained, as replacing them is not seen as realistic, and they were not believed to be causing the breakdowns. Parts of the officer accommodation has been converted to house a high-voltage switchboard room to help manage the 5 megawatts of additional power now available as a result of the refit. Imagine sleeping next to a high-voltage switchboard. I guess that's just something you have to get used to as a Royal Navy officer. The total cost, estimated at hundreds of millions of pounds, reflects both the complexity of the engineering work and the operational strain caused by removing ships from service for extended periods. Cutting open the hulls to install new power generators was not cheap. The Type 45 was not built with modularity in mind to easily facilitate this sort of refit. The ship is a closed system. So it is a complicated exercise to remove things from the hull, make the necessary changes, and to patch up the hull again afterwards. While the PIP will ultimately make the Type 45 a more dependable platform, the propulsion failures remain a case study in overambitious design, risky innovation at the expense of reliability, and inadequate testing. Even once the PIP is fully implemented, which will take years and the propulsion issue is fixed, the Type 45 class will still be constrained by the very small size of the fleet. The Royal Navy had originally planned 12 vessels, but ended up with just 6, owing in part to a redirection of focus to small and medium scale operations. As the UK followed in the footsteps of America's war in the Middle East. Ultimately, even though the Type 45 excels in air defense, its overall effectiveness depends entirely on reliable propulsion and power systems. A ship cannot project power or defend a fleet if it cannot move or sustain its sensors and weapons. The PIP will address many of the propulsion weakness, but implementation is slow, constrained by limited shipyard capacity, high cost, and the need for skilled engineers to carry out complex refits. Until all six ships are upgraded, operational availability remains limited. In combat or high-tempo operations, any lapse in power compromises the Sea Viper system, radar performance, and onboard electronics. The Type 45 is therefore highly capable, in theory, at least in the role it is designed to perform, but a rather vulnerable platform in practice. Its advanced air defense can only be fully effective when propulsion, electrical power, and maintenance are all brought together. Without these complementary elements, even the most sophisticated weapon systems cannot fulfill their intended role. 